what's really important that I wanted to touch on is uh, there's a, a trend of an erosion of trust in our industry. And it's never, as you can see, Void here, he's a little, little upset if you guys remember from the movie. Um, but a, a huge issue when there is an erosion of trust is that people react a certain way. In the movie, he, he got into the uh, turbo lax. Um, but when people don't trust what they can read or engage with, whether it be advertisement, whether it be uh, digital media, there's a problem and people act differently. And we're in this, uh, th uh, for this event, it's so important that we get together and talk about this transparently because it's our not just opportunity, but it's our burden as well as media leaders to think through this is how we can earn and not lose trust. And so I only have. 13 minutes and 48 seconds left. So I'm going to um, take the time to be fairly simple and hit on some um, simple points so you can um, think about how you can continue to earn trust and not lose it with your platforms. Sorry, you had to keep looking at that the whole time, by the way. Um, but the first thing is uh, micro-influencers. This is a new trend and a new rise. This, this kind of came to us at Influence Co. when we worked with LinkedIn to test out their contributor platform. It was extremely eye-opening when we started working with them. That was very early on when they had the influencer program and contributors. Because what you could see is that all it took was sometimes one person reading or sharing. And it can make a post go viral or hit the right audience. All it takes is one action of getting on the right email list, reaching one person, and it can change who viewed that post. So it's extremely important that you are, you are growing, you're not just micro-influencers, but brand advocacy, because then you create this spread effect. And as unfortunate as it is, there's a lot of platforms that earn, they work their butts off for years to earn trust and to get to a point where they are a very engaged platform. And then you almost have pride going the way, and you think, OK, well, we have all these people paying attention to us. And you lose the, uh, and you, you almost stop earning that. And there's a lot of times I see this with media leaders, and there's this almost like perception of, uh, I'm above you. And this is something where when I talk to different people about how they interact with media sometimes, is that sometimes when you have a platform, pride does, can get in the way. You can say, wow. People pay attention to us. Um, me, myself, like I battle with that. Um, and you have to remember is that it's not that you're, the, the platform is so awesome. It's, it's you're in a position to truly educate. You're the ones that people are sharing content. I'll give an example of my wife later on, that people are paying attention to what you control in this room as editors, as people who are involved in media. And I'm going to use this example just because it's related to um, my business, but um, this was a couple years ago. Uh, I got an intro from a CEO to, uh, of a media site to their editor, and this was a response that I got. Hey, John, I have thousands of people that reach out to me every day. I hope you don't actually think I can get to this one in the next couple weeks. I actually made this sound a lot better than it was. Uh, and so, but you get the point. They were a, a butthead. Um, and I, I'll tell you the, the results of this situation is that um, a year later, uh, there was a brand that wanted to actually sponsor this one of their events and work with their editorial team. And they asked me, they said, hey, should we work with this uh, company? And I go, hey, honestly, I'm not going to blackball, but at the same time, here's my transparent feedback of, of how I dealt with that, or uh, of my encounter. They ended up not sponsoring the event. A year and a half later, the same editor asked for an intro to me, somehow forgot that they sent this email, and wanted to work for Influence & Co. <laughs> So look at this situation where not only personal, it personally affected them, it affected the brand, and also I stopped sharing content out myself. And, and this was a site that I actually did share a decent amount of content from, and I stopped after that. It makes sense. Likeability ended, trust ended. Um, and I, I want to give an opposite example um, is, this is I am human, and, and I promise Catherine's here today. She's actually right there, very nice uh, woman from HBR. But this is her employee that, um, uh, she, if, you, if you just look, she, there's actually, this is a more concise one, but she, she, uh, she said, this is extremely well written, but I'm afraid the advice it overlaps a, a bit too much with what we already have published on content marketing. I'm afraid I won't be able to use it. Sorry to bear the bad news. Like, she was nice to the point. A lot of times she offers feedback. Uh, she's an example of somebody that she doesn't always go my way at all. I mean, she challenges things, and she makes you work for it. Um, but at the same time, like I'm a, I'm a big brand advocate for HBR, not just because I like their content, but also I think people look at things, not just the content, but they look at the people behind it as well sometimes. And so for me, I've not only become a natural brand advocate for sharing that content, I probably share it 
one or two, uh, one or two times I share an article, or let's say one or two times a week I'm at least sharing a H an HBR article. And we share it within our own company. And so that's an example of when you think about distribution, everybody matters in how you're communicating with people. And um, there's uh, anybody can be an advocate for you. And that's just a good example. And so think about your everyday um, interactions. And I know sometimes you're busy, you're all over the place. Um, but think about how you're, you're not just communicating with people. Nicole, it, I'm trying to think, Nicole was the first speaker. Is she there? Yeah, something that I loved about her is that she's one of the most successful people in this room, in my opinion. She's done great things. And I was just watching her interact with people over here and the students, and she was so positive and so nice, and she was just such a good representation of media. And she has a lot of influence. So, I mean, kudos to you, and, and that's something that I, I realized. And so, um, think about that. So, the, this is something that's not new at all. The rise of branded, branded publications, something I wanted to bring this up today is that it's just affecting everyone in this room that brands are starting to realize that sometimes the best way to engage a specific audience is something that media has been doing for years. They've, understand how, they've understood how to engage people in the right time and in the right way. And so I want to use this example. This is a fun one that I, I love using, but this is Lessons from the Smartest Woman I Know, which is my wife. Uh, second smartest woman I know is my co-founder, so she's right there. So, but my wife trumps her in this, in this example. Um, this was something, like my, my wife and I work very hard on our marriage, and every month we get together and we talk about things we can do to make each other happier. And um, one of the things in one of our first meetings, she said that she wanted me to cook more. And uh, like a good, uh, well, no, not good spouse, I said, great, yes, I'll do it. And I actually didn't do it. Uh, and a week later, I um, didn't do it. She sent me an article that was about essential tools that are needed in the kitchen to cook effectively. <laughs> and it was from Plated's uh, publication. So then a week later, I still hadn't done anything. And she sent me, it was like, I forgot, I need to look it up again, but it was like confessions from a dumb spouse who doesn't know how to cook. And I was like, that is me. And so I felt so uh, connected to the content. And um, it was like a week later when we, we hadn't met up yet again to have our kind of uh, date night. Um, she, she made a comment. She goes, hey, have you been cooking? And I go, Oh, crap. And you have that moment. It's what I call a moment of vulnerability. And it happens when your boss comes to you and asks you for the TPS reports. You don't, got it done, you don't have it done. And you're like, what do I do? It happens in a, a variety of different moments. And for me, I went to immediately to those articles. And I went there, and I, and I actually signed up for as, as a client of Plated. Those of you guys don't know, it's like the Blue Apron model where they send you um, pre-portioned meals. And so I, I secretly had it sent to me without my wife knowing. I, I cooked. And when she got home, I had thrown it like it was a high school party. And I threw it like the trash in the back where she couldn't find it. And so for uh, a week or two, I was doing that. And it was working out great. And um, I, I finally went to her because I'm all about trust. And so I said, hey, honey, I just got to come clean. She goes, oh, no, I know you've been using plated. Are you kidding me? <laughs> she goes, she goes you, you've got to be like. John, what I was doing is I was getting you information so you were able to actually like solve the problem and actually get it done. And so I was influencing a behavior by getting you the right information that you need. Isn't that what you do? And like, isn't that? And I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, she, I was like, my wife. And like, if you guys think I'm joking, this is my lovely wife. This is her using the, my own force. And this is me. <laughs> with a really wrinkly apron. And um, so it, it's something that I, and I actually took a, uh, at first it was, it was a really fun story to tell, but I actually dissected this a little more. And some of the lessons from this is that I asked my wife, I said, what did you, like, how did you come upon that article? And she was like, well, there was a couple things that happened. One, I was just naturally um, reading things and I was searching and I found the article. And then also somebody that I had followed when I was looking for cooking actually shared out the same article. And these, these two kind of natural things that happened made me think this is the right information. I'm going to use this. And so what they did was they, in that way, were owning their organic um, uh, distribution. So one was search, and another one was involved in, I guess, influencer um, uh, or relationships with influencers or getting content in front of the right people. And as crazy as it is, a lot of media outlets are not doing this. They're not thinking about distribution. They're so focused on what are we doing, what's the, the content. They're not actually planning out um, how people are finding that content. And one example of one, this is probably one of the top 10 visited sites in the, in the world. I was actually sitting with this guy over here, John Rampton. You can say hi to everyone. Uh, John, we were sitting there meeting with them. And they were not even indexing their second, third, fourth, or fifth pages of content. 
So it wasn't even, none of those pages were showing up for search. And he simply said, guys, like, this is something you have to be thinking about with distribution. I mean, this is a this search example, but it immediately it helped with their traffic and distribution because people were finding things easier. Now, there's a lot of things that you need to look through and look at your organic distribution. That was just one. But look at where audiences are, new audiences are, and, and create a checklist. Our company has checklists on this organic distribution. And it's not just about the view. It's about who is actually reading this and engaging with this content. And the second one. This came up actually um, last night. I was at uh, John Schieber. There you go. You're here. It's good to see you, man. Um, last night we were having a beer, and when I was talking to him, it was actually somewhat inspirational and a reminder of the passion that journalists, editors have about content. Like he was so into like, oh my god, like, like he was describing how excited he gets when he gets the right story and when he's, in, when he's getting certain content. It, it was really interesting to hear that. And I think that that's one of the great things about journalists and editors, that they can think like that. But you have to marry that with the audience. Because sometimes we almost get, in, I know myself with my own writing, I get in my own silo on what I think is interesting. And I always have to be thinking about what's audience centric. And um, the lesson that I learned from Plated is that I contacted their, their co-founder to figure out how this happened afterwards. I said, hey, just so you know, I actually ran I go, I got to tell you this story. And he's like, this is awesome. Uh, and so he, uh, he goes, well, I talked to the editor. And what they did was they simply identified a bunch of the real problems that people were having that signed up for their service. And they, needed that, they, they wanted to be a resource for them. And they were thinking about the audience here. So it wasn't even saying that, hey, the editor thought this was the most interesting stuff. It was solving real challenges um, and interesting content. What I almost ca uh, call it is idea content. So it's, um, it has to have, offer some value to the audience, not just what's interesting to you. So is it industry leading? So there's your eye. Is it data driven? Is it educational or how to? Um, and is it amusing? You have to offer value. And that's something as um, when you're running a platform, you've got to, it, it's very easy to think what you think is interesting. But you've, you've got to have that, that gift that you've been given and kind of um, uh, marry that with the, con uh, with the audience that you're trying to engage with. And one of the most important things is that we actually developed in that example um, a relationship with Plated. I mean, I'm speaking about it and giving an example so that you can tell there's a, I'm a customer too. Um, and no matter what um, platform you have, that relationship is super important. It's important to understand what metrics are of success. And so that leads into what I'm going to end on is there's th we every year we do uh, Brittany Dahl um, right there. She does a survey for us where she goes out and talks to managing editors. I think some of the managing editors that are here uh, have taken part in this survey, and we gather information on what success with distribution, what um, they're thinking about, what's their biggest pet peeve, and so here's some of the takeaways. Um, one of the most important things that I would say is that. 62% of people still say page views or visits are a major metric of success with distribution. We heard Read Right talk about that it's the right views. We've heard other people talk about the right views. And it's important that um, as brands or whoever is paying for content or whatever, um, or they're going to look at the analytics of content. And as you see, some of these other ones, time on site is starting to, um, uh, to influence. But when you think about it, these analytics are only going to improve. And it's going to be, what did they feel afterwards? What did they read? Did they click? Um, when they clicked, what happened after that? There's going to be all these things happen. And it's important to know is that it's not just about the view. There's a lot of um, media outlets that are only concerned with views. Trust me, I'm in conversations all the time where they're like, we're only looking at views right now. And you have to evolve with how analytics and how people are actually wanting to form a relationship. So be thinking about your own metrics and what is real success. Because right now, views might be fine with some advertisers, but they're going to become more involved, and you want to be in front of them. Um, this is a quick slide. I think the, the big takeaway for me here was um, the, the end, the last one under headlines. And, and this is not just with headlines. This is for headlines and content, clear, compelling, concise. A lot of times people ask what length something should be. Um, ultimately, if it's clear, if it's compelling, if it's concise, uh, if it's valuable, um, you know, long form content can do uh, well. But this is just some of the stats that um, were incorporated in some of the, the information that we got. And lastly, this is something that's directly related to us because we need to know where our business model is heading. Uh, and so, and I think John's going to talk about the contributor model even more with his unique experiences there. Um, but for us, it was it was nice to see this stat for us just because we deal a lot with contributed content. So, 96% of editors say they're going to publish the same amount or um, more of contributed content. Uh, and it does make sense. Is that it's content that is from 
experts, hopefully, and um, it's, it's at a, a lower cost. Um, what I will tell you is that, though, it's not just accepting contributor content. There's a, a, a right way and a wrong way to, to do it. And you have to have, just like the basic premise of journalism, you have to have trusted sources for this content. And it's, it goes back to the basics of journalism. And when you think about it, is that, and when you look at how you're getting that, that content, whether it be internal or contributed, it's trusted partners from people who truly care. Like at this point, it's got to be contributors that care about the audience, similar to what I just went over. And so um, when you're looking at expanding, if you do have a platform and you are getting the guest content, you'll learn some things from um, John here where what's worked, what, ha what um, hasn't. But at the same time is that ultimately, if you can trust the source and it's good content that's engaging, then a lot of times it, it's a win for you. Um, and then lastly, just really um, ending on, well. Well, for, well, the ending is I'm here to help. I'm here all night. If you guys want to chat about this, I love chatting about this, and I love each. Um, I mean, really, when we, we get a chance to talk to uh, peers, it's it's a blessing for us. And so, look forward to learning more. And uh, yeah, it was fun. So thank you for having me. John Hall, thank you, John.